Hey everybody, this box contains Poseidon's long-awaited first hardtail mountain bike offering, and it was designed in collaboration with Eric over at the SpinNet YouTube channel, and we're all pretty excited about it. In this video, I'll show you how to build it up from the box, and together we'll all get a first look at the Poseidon Norton. So after you have the box open, you want to carefully use some cutters to cut some of the zip ties, so that you can pull out the seat, the small parts box, the wheels, and the frame. First thing we want to do is to unpackage the very well protected frame and fork by cutting off all the zip ties and foam padding. Now you definitely want to do this carefully so that you don't scratch any of the painted surfaces underneath. So we're going to grab the seat, pull off the packaging, put a thin layer of grease on the inside of the seat tube, and just cinch it down using a 5mm Allen wrench. Now this is not required, but if you are using a work stand, now would be a good time to put it up. We don't want to let the fork dangle from the brake line, so I'm just going to hang it from the stand like so. Now at this point we can start getting rid of the rest of the packaging on the bike. So now in the small parts box you will find the front and rear disc rotors, disc rotor mounting bolts, a pair of plastic test ride pedals, the rear through axle, and the headset bits. So now before we install the headset, we actually want to grease the integrated headset cups in the head tube. So you don't need a ton of grease, but you do want to get a thin coat on the entire metal surface. And it's also a good idea to get a thin layer of grease right on the crown where the race is going to sit. Now this is a split crown race, and you want the angular bevels to face up. So that's just going to go straight on like so. And you want to make sure you push it all the way down so it's flush on the crown of the fork. Thin layer of grease. Now the bearing itself has got a flat side and then the beveled side. So the beveled side is going to be pointing up. And if you look actually on the inner side of the bottom of the bearing, there's a bevel there, which is going to match up with the bevel on the crown race. So now at this point you can go ahead and insert the fork from the bottom. And what you're looking for is that lower bearing to sit right into the integrated headset cup at the bottom of the head tube. Now at the top, what you want is the upper headset bearing to have the beveled side facing down so that it mates with the integrated headset cup at the top of the head tube. The upper bearing should sit flat with the top of the head tube, but it's not going to go all the way in. There's going to be this little protrusion at the top, and that's normal. Now what you want to do is to take a lightly greased compression ring, and this split ring is going to help center the fork steerer inside of the head tube. Now on top of that, you're going to use the upper headset cap, like so. Now the bike ships with three headset spacers, and so you can basically configure these however you'd like. So I think what I'm going to do actually is to put two spacers underneath, and one on top. Now at the very top, you should see that the highest spacer sits above the top of the fork steer tube, which you can see here. It's because you're gonna use the top cap and the screw to apply preload to the headset bearings. Now the way to tell if you have the right amount of preload is to incrementally tighten down the preload cap until there's no more movement between the fork relative to the frame, but not so tight that it's hard to spin the handlebars. Once you have your preload set, which by the way was a five millimeter Allen wrench, you wanna go ahead and tighten down the pinch bolts on the stem. So just kind of cinch these down. We're gonna straighten out the handlebars and give it a final torque at the end of the build. Now if you had any residual packaging on the handlebars like I did, you can go ahead and remove that as well. We'll tackle the drivetrain next. So what you wanna do is to just take your time and kind of unravel the chain. And then you can go ahead and drape the chain over the chain ring. Now using a five millimeter Allen wrench, you wanna go ahead and remove the dropout mounting bolts. And then you wanna pull the derailleur housing to the outside of the bike. Now what you wanna do is to align the removable dropout with the inside of the frame, like so. And then from the outer side of the bike, you wanna reinstall the mounting bolts. Don't be shy when you're tightening these bolts because this removable dropout is the thing that's actually attaching to your wheel and it's holding your drivetrain in place. So this is what the drivetrain should look like once the derailleur is installed. Now what we're gonna do is to go ahead and install the disc rotors. You're gonna wanna go ahead and unpackage those. And as you're doing so, try and be real careful not to touch the braking surface with your bare hands. Now these are not front and rear specific, but they are directional. So you wanna make sure to look at the direction indicator for the proper orientation of the disc. So you can go ahead and line up the holes and then open the package with the 12 disc mounting screws. To install these, you actually need a T25 Torx bit, which looks like this. Now for me, I like to use a typical screwdriver type handle like this, just to get all the bolts started. And then I'll finish them off with a torque wrench to make sure we're torquing these bolts properly. In general, you're aiming for about four to six Newton meters of torque. And then just repeat this process for the other rotor and your wheels will be ready for installation. So you want to grab the rear axle and give it a thin layer of grease, especially on the threads. 
It's also a good idea to loosen up the brake caliper, which is done by loosening the two caliper mounting bolts here and here. And that will allow the caliper to slide back and forth and it'll allow us to install the wheel a little bit easier. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull the chain up and back, and then slide the wheel up into its dropouts, while at the same time making sure that the disc rotor slides between the two brake pads on the caliper. And then you can let the chain go on the smallest cog. You can go ahead and feed the rear through axle through the whole thing and thread it into the dropout on the other side. Now we are looking for 10 Newton meters of torque. This is gonna to use a six millimeter Allen wrench, like so. These brakes are actually really cool. These are the Juntek brakes and they're a cable actuated hydraulic disc brake. So there's actually mineral oil in the caliper and it's a closed system, but the pistons are hydraulically actuated by this lever arm, which is pulled by a cable. Now there's a screw here, which you can use to adjust the pad gap. And so if you tighten this screw, you get less pad gap for a tighter feeling brake. And if you loosen this, pad gap widens a bit. And so you can kind of adjust this until the feel at the lever is how you like it. Now remember we loosened up the caliper to make it easier to install the wheel, but you'll notice Notice that if you spin the wheel, you're almost guaranteed to get some pad rub because the rotor is actually rubbing against one of the brake pads. So what you're trying to do now is to align the caliper such that you get equal pad gap on either side and you want the pads to be parallel to the rotor. So once you have the caliper where you like it, you can cinch them back down with a five millimeter Allen wrench. And each time you do this, you wanna give the brake lever a couple of squeezes and then spin the wheel and see if you get any pad rub. All right, so I got lucky. I got it on the first try. This may take a few attempts until you get even pad gap on either side and no rubbing. Now for the bolt torque on the calipers, we're aiming for somewhere between six and eight Newton meters using a five millimeter Allen wrench. Like so. So the front wheel installs a little bit differently. What you do is you open the quick release lever, like so, and then you push this little tab in, and that just allows you to slide the whole axle out. Like so. And then you can go ahead and install the front wheel. Then you go ahead and take the skewer and push it through again. And once it comes out the other side, you just wanna make sure that it pops into place. So this kind of like split collet needs to actually fully open outside of the dropout before you can close the axle. And then from here, it's just like any other quick release. You use this to tighten or loosen the tension. And what you're looking for is essentially to meet tension when the quick release lever is basically pointing straight outward. So this right now could use a little more tension. This is a case when there's probably too much tension. Loosen that knob on the opposing side until we just meet tension when the lever is pointing straight outward. And then we'll finish the job by squeezing that lever up towards the fork, like so. So once the wheel is installed, the brake alignment is identical to the rear. Again, we're just trying to align the pads so that they're parallel to the braking surface like so. Now next is to install the pedals, which are left, right specific. Now the thing about pedals is that the right hand side or the drive side is a normal thread. The left hand side or the non-drive side is a reverse thread. And just make sure to get some grease on the threads of the pedals before you install them. Now I've got an actual pedal wrench here, which is nice because it's thin and it's long so that you have a lot of leverage. Any 15 millimeter spanner that can fit between the pedal and the crank will do. Now you don't want to go too crazy with the torque on the pedals. You do want them nice and tight so that they don't back out while you're riding. Now the last thing we have to do is just to set up the shifting and make sure that we can go all the way up and down the cassette. We just want the drivetrain to be really smooth. So while you're pedaling, you can use the big thumb lever on the shifter to shift up the cassette. You just go one at a time to make sure that you can get into every gear with no issues. And then to come back down the cassette into a higher gear, you use a smaller paddle on the shifter. Now, most of the time, it's gonna be set up pretty well out of the box, but if you're finding that it's hesitating to go from smaller cogs into larger ones, you can turn the barrel adjuster counterclockwise as if to loosen it a quarter turn at a time until it no longer hesitates to go up the cassette. Now, on the flip side, if you're finding that the chain hesitates to go from larger cogs into smaller ones, you can turn that barrel adjuster clockwise as if to tighten it about a quarter turn at a time. Now, this process is called indexing the gears, and it probably won't have to be done because these are set up pretty well from the factory, but if it is hesitating in either direction, you can use this process to smooth out the shifting. At this point, we can inflate our tires to our preferred pressure. Now this bike comes with pressed to valve inner tubes, so you'll need a pump with a pressed to valve head or a normal pump with a pressed to valve adapter. And the way to inflate these inner tubes is to remove the valve cap and unscrew the pressed to valve itself. And then you can install a pump head and start pumping to your desired pressure. Now when you finish, you can go ahead and close up the valve and reinstall the valve cap. 
Now at this point, you just want to make sure that your handlebars are straight. You can also rotate the handlebars forward and backwards, and you can also change the angle of the controls to your preferred position. Now once you've got everything where you like it, you should give the stem pinch bolts and the handlebar pinch bolts a final torque. Currently we're aiming for about five Newton meters of torque with the stem faceplate as well as the stem pinch bolts. Now I should make it absolutely clear, you definitely do not want to torque the stem top cap because remember again, this is just setting the preload for the bearings. All right, so that's the build. The bike is now fully complete. Before you head onto the trails for the first time, you definitely want to make sure to take the time to bed the brakes properly. And in order to do that, what you want to do is to go out to a flat open space where you can get the bike up to 15, 18 miles per hour, and then apply moderate brake pressure to one brake at a time until you come to walking speed, but don't come to a complete stop. Now you wanna repeat this process 10 to 15 times per brake, which is gonna deposit a little bit of the brake pad material onto the rotor to help maximize the stopping power. Okay, so there it is, the brand new Poseidon Norton Hardtail Mountain Bike. Now to give you a little bit of a walkthrough, we have an alloy frame, but it's really nice. If you look at all the joints, they're nice and smoothed out, which is something that we haven't seen before on the Poseidon frames. Now, I don't know what this color is, but it's this gloss kind of metallic green. It looks really nice. Now starting at the front, we have the SR Suntour XCM34. This is a boost fork, which is nice because that's kind of the modern standard for all mountain bikes. We have 27.5 inch diameter wheels, front and rear. And these are the Kenda Slant 6 tires in 27.5 by 2.35 width. Now for the brakes, again, this is really cool. You get the Juntech mechanically actuated hydraulic disc brakes. So they're gonna give you plenty of stopping power. Now for the drivetrain, there's no surprise here. Poseidon is using the Microshift Advent X 1x10 drivetrain. I believe this cassette goes from 11 to 48 and it's made it to a 32 tooth narrow wide chain ring. Now, while the bike does not come with a dropper in stock form, there are accommodations in the frame to run an internally routed dropper, which is really nice because presumably most most people who get this bike will eventually want to add a dropper seat post. Now in stock form, all the cabling is internally routed, but I also noticed that there's these brake cable bosses mounted along the left side of the top tube and the left seat stay. And this is for if you want to run external cabling to your rear brake, which some people want to do because it eliminates the headache of running internal cabling. Now I forgot to mention that the brake rotors are 180 millimeters in diameter front and rear, and the hubs are a fairly generic through axle hub by the brand Quanta. And then lastly, the saddle is actually noteworthy here because up until recently, Recently, Poseidon had been using a fairly long and narrow saddle, which I believe some customers had issues with. But recently on the newer Poseidon X Ambition gravel bike, and here on the new Norton frame, we're using this updated split saddle, which is a lot more comfortable than the previous version. And I think that's about it. Now, if you have any questions at all about the build process or the spec of this bike, feel free to reach out down in the comments below. Well, I hope you enjoyed getting a first look at the new Poseidon Norton hardtail, and I'm looking forward to getting some miles on it so that I can put together a proper review. But in the meantime, thanks again for watching. Thanks for subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.